Today we're going to talk about open source log analytics or crawling logs with ELK. For those that don't know, ELK is a Elasticsearch log session combiner and we'll go into what each of those are as we go through the talk. I'm the support engineer for Australia and New Zealand. Um, I've been using ELK for around about two years. Previously I was a Linux engineer and I handled the ELK stack and just general Linux infrastructure. I work for an email service provider in Australia. So Elasticsearch, you, probably, you may not have heard about them. We do have some local customers like Xero um, and Seek. If you've used GitHub, our, uh, the code search and the repo search, that's all powered by Elasticsearch. The company was formed in 2012. We're, very, we're big in the EU and US. We're still sort of making our, I guess, our move into the Australian market. So for this talk, what is a log? Well, it, really, it's just a timestamp with a string. So when you think about it in that basic term, you've got server logs, you've got Twitter streams, you've even got metrics. And we're being increasingly told to log everything, which is all good and well, but um, formatting really sucks, yeah? You get format frustration, dealing with different timestamps, dealing with different logs, dealing with things that don't have timestamps. It's, it's really an, very, very annoying. So why do we even want to collect and centralize the logs, because giving uneducated people access to your systems can be dangerous, because you don't want to have a hundred different shell scripts to deal with a hundred different log formats. Because you want to be able to do stuff like get, watch an email, get hit your gateway server, then move through and then watch the user actually pick it up. Because you don't want to be your boss's charting library, your boss's grep. Because really you want to democratize your data, democratize your logs. And um, apparently because Docker and Mesos logging really sucks, so this is a really, really good way to do it. So, and how do we do this? Well, if, with Elk, obviously. So this is a quick rundown of Elasticsearch. Um, it scales to hundreds of nodes, terabytes of data. Uh, it's pretty simple. Zero config means the, the defaults that we ship, they're sane up until a size, reasonable size, maybe about 10 nodes or so. After that, you want to start looking at changing things. So a few basic terms. An index is essentially a database for Elasticsearch. It's broken into shards, which are then spread across all of your different nodes in the cluster. And then you can replicate the indexes as well, which provides scalability and some redundancy. So when you've got a cluster in Elasticsearch, you have a single master at any point in time. Um, and handles your cluster state when nodes join and leave, index creation, that sort of thing. So when you do want to create a cluster, you can have multicast or unicast discovery. You do need to configure this. Uh, by default, it's multicast. And if you actually spin up a whole, if we spun up a bunch of machines in here, they'd all form a single cluster. So the best bit to do if you're in production or even just playing around is to set your cluster name so that you create your own specific cluster. If you want to use unicast, you just listen to IPs. And yeah, you definitely want to keep your, your master eligible node count uneven. Just helps with um, split brain. Uh, this is an interesting question. So the answer to this is pretty much always it depends. And it depends on all this stuff here. So the best way to, to actually figure out how big your node needs to be for your data set is just to, to just get a node. It can be a VM or something, a, a physical machine, something that's indicative of what you're looking at using. Uh, create a single index with a single shard and no replicas, just throw data at it. Once it falls over, you've got a bit of a limit there. You know what you're going to work with. And because this is Java-based, you want to keep your heap under 32 gigs, so 31 is good, because basically once you hit 32 gig, your Java pointers are not compressed and you start losing some inefficiency, or well, you start losing efficiencies. It's a pretty big ecosystem around Elasticsearch. There's a whole bunch of plugins for languages for monitoring. There's one for attachments as well, so you can use basically index attachments on emails, that sort of thing. There's a whole bunch of clients. I just realized that .NET is wrong. It should be we actually have a Nest client for, for .NET. We've got Hadoop integration. Um, and there's also the EOK stack as well, which you can kind of think of as being part of the ecosystem. So, super quick, this is, if you want to do something in development, you want to have a play around, you can do this on your laptop. It's really that simple. 
this is we can check if it's alive if you get a 200 response it's Elasticsearch is ready to receive and index data and also do searching on the data and it's near real time so some cool tools uh, Elasticsearch is full of APIs but it's returned most things are, everything's returned as a JSON but JSON's kind of sucky to read you can use the question mark pretty on the end of a request and it'll line feed format stuff which makes it a bit easier but, and this is an example, right? So we're asking for the cluster state. We're asking, we're getting the cluster state. And if you look at the top here, you've got master node, and that's an ID that Elasticsearch generates. Um, can you, if you can tell, it's the bottom one, right? That's not very easy to read. Now it's super easy to read. So the CAT API has a whole bunch of endpoints here. Really handy for doing quick CLI checks or if you want to build things around Nagios um, plugins, that sort of thing. Very, very handy. Around monitoring, there are some community uh, plugins. We also offer a Marvel plugin, which is free for dev use. Um, it also comes included with a support contract. So when you want to scale out a single node for Elasticsearch, it's pretty simple. You just follow these steps. The cool thing about it is once a node joins a cluster, the shards that you've got will automatically balance across the new nodes. You can query and insert via any node while things are being rebalanced as well. And as long as you've got replicas set, you can survive the loss of a node. Uh, the bottom tip, all writes in Elasticsearch are done sequentially, even an update to a document. So if you use the NOP schedule, you find yourself, uh, you'll get better performance, especially with SSDs. So super quick summary of Logstash. Uh, you can kind of think of it like an army knife or a multi-tool for, well, we, it's primarily logs, but you can pass any sort of data into it. This is the general architecture. So you have a whole bunch of different inputs, then you pass it through into filters, and then you spit it back out. So here's a couple of inputs. Uh, monitoring ones, different data stores, so you can pull stuff out of Redis. You can pull things out of an email account, for example. You can listen on a TCP socket. Uh, different filters, and, and this is where you kind of manipulate your data and really add value to it. So some interesting ones are the GeoIP, which is where you actually take an IP and then using an inbuilt database within Logstash, you can, you can get a latitude and longitude. So you can use that later on. Uh, the date's really cool because you can actually set a standard date format or if you really want, you can change it. If anyone here is familiar with Logstash, there's Grok. Um, if you're not familiar with Logstash, you will get to know Grok pretty familiarly. It's very powerful pattern matching. And then once you're filtered, you spit it back out. And again, we've got monitoring. We can send it out again to a different protocol. We can send it to Elasticsearch. You can send it to send it out. So there's about 150 inputs, filters, and outputs built into Logstash. There's another contrib package from the community with another 100. Um, very simple to build your own and include those as well. Again, really quick to, to get up and running. You do need a config. You do need Java 7 or Java 8, same with Elasticsearch. Uh, that one's kind of boring. We'll have a look at this one. So here we're passing, we're just telling to listen on standard in, and then the, whatever, you get sent, whatever gets sent in is, consists of these three parts of a message. And then when you pass in that string, you can see here it's actually broken stuff out. And it's really simple, but it gives you an idea. So this is a postfix example. We've got a bit more of a complex Grok filter. Um, we've also standardised, we're also taking, we're matching it, we're doing a date filter. And then, again, we're spinning it back out. And this is what you get. And this is kind of where you can start to see things, you're getting more value out of your logs. You're getting things like your program or your PID. Uh, you've got the original message at the top as well. This is a CLF, so Apache or Nginx, most people will probably know it as. Um, this is kind of really, really cool because you can actually see here we've got the, the get verb broken out, we've got the response broken out, we've got the bytes broken out. And what you can actually do is once you get it to this point and put it into Elasticsearch, you can start going, well, give me all the non-200 responses and then for a date range, or you can say, give me all the 200 responses and tell me how many bytes that used. And then you can graph all of this and it becomes, you know, it's rather than having to do a grep and then a, a, and count and add all those up, you can actually do it graphically. 
So one thing we haven't done here is we haven't broken out the client IP and geolocated it. The agent down the bottom, we actually have a user agent pattern where it'll actually break these all down so you can do further queries based on, you know, show me all the Windows users between this time and, and that sort of thing. And then to get it to Elasticsearch, it's just as simple as Elasticsearch, putting the Elasticsearch protocol uh, in the output there. And then you can see here the match message of combined, combined Apache log. So this is actually that um, pattern. And these are patterns that are broken. Uh, they're actually included in log stash. There's a whole bunch of them. And again, you can build your own and include those. So you want to deploy. This is essentially what a general um, uh, pipeline will look like. Your ship is going to be something like R syslog or a log stash instance. It can be something that spits out logs on TCP or UDP, for example. It's pretty, like, it's good. It'll work. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you want to do downstream maintenance, if you want to change your log stash config, if you want to update Elasticsearch, that sort of thing, well, you chuck in a broker. And the most common brokers we see are things like Redis or Kafka or Rabbit or Zero MQ. And then you scale that out, and then you scale that out, and then you scale that out, and then you scale that out. And you can get to thousands of nodes with, uh, or thousands of shippers. Um, we've got customers with tens of thousands. We have Elasticsearch clusters with hundreds of nodes with petabyte sort of counts, trillions of documents, a document being essentially uh, a log line or an event. We haven't touched on Kibana. Uh, Kibana is Kibana 3 at the moment, which is the, the current general uh, availability version. It's just JSS and CSS. You can put it under whatever you want. There's some sample configs on GitHub under the Kibana repo that you can use for Apache and Nginx. Uh, version 4 is on the way. It's a complete rewrite. It's currently in beta. Um, if you're using Kibana 3 and you haven't tried out 4, check it out. It's really, really cool. Um, Kibana 4 will only work with Elasticsearch 1.4, though, so be aware of that. So we've taken all of our Apache logs and our Nginx logs and whatever else you want, and this is actually how you can graphically portray it. So this is uh, an Apache log, and we've got things at the top here. We have separate queries that are broken out into just the different file types. And this is a, looks like a 24-hour time range. Um, and then you can see, so you can see the site, like the use cycle. So you can tell what your peak, where are your peak hours. Um, you've got a breakdown of your requests as well. And then down the bottom there is actually a table with a list of all the events that relate to this time range. So you can update this dynamically and it'll update all the graphs dynamically as well. Similar sort of thing here, a couple of different graphs. You've got a terms panel over the side giving you counts. Uh, this is just a, um, a dark theme and the previous one was a light theme. This one's pretty cool because it actually shows the use of the Twitter input in Logstash, and they've pulled in tweets, and then they've broken them down. That's kind of a bit of a bad picture, but they've actually broken them down into languages. So you can see the different languages in the line graph over there, and then they've geolocated them onto the map as well. And then down the bottom, there's, an act there's a trend, um, a little trend bar. So in Kibana terms, this whole thing is a dashboard, and then the graphs, and then the world map, and then the trends, they're panels, and you basically uh, build your panels, and there's a whole different sort of panels you can use. So some useful helpers, we've got Curator, which manages your indexes in Elasticsearch, um, it's just a Python app, it's really handy, you can use um, relative time frames, you can use relative sizes, so you know, delete or indexes older than X, or keep only enough indexes so that I am only using one terabyte or 500 gig or whatever you want. There's Puppet and Chef modules. The Logstash folder is written in Go, so you can compile wherever you want. It's low overhead, so if you don't want to install Java anywhere, if you've got a small system with not many resources, it's really good. Grok Debugger is a community app. It's really cool for pattern matching, so if, once you start playing around with Grok, you can just plug a line, a log line into this and you'll get a pattern out from it. You can play around and build your own patterns. So all of our code's up on GitHub for everything. All of our docs are up on our site. We have a really strong community. We've got Google Groups for Elasticsearch and Logstash. We've got a whole bunch of IRC channels as well. I hang out there a fair bit and because I'm currently the only one in this time zone, um, you'll see me talking a lot and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, we're always hiring as well. so. 
if you're interested, come and have a chat to me. I'm happy to answer technical questions. I've got a bunch of stickers and whatnot as well. Our community manager, Leslie Hawthorne, is also giving a talk tomorrow. She's up the back there. So, um, yeah, please do come and see us and ask questions. I'm more than happy to have a chat to anyone. Thank you. Okay, we've got uh, enough time for some questions. This uh, nominal five minute break between this and the next talk, so make a run for it. This one over there on the right. Is it, uh, does your system handle uh, large uh, documents at all? Is it possible to store binary blobs, for example, crash dump files associated with log entries? Um. So it's not appropriate. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Yeah, it depends how big you're talking, though. But yeah, it depends. This one down the front. Yeah. We've we've got uh, some, you know, about uh, 300 gigs of logs a day, and um, a day. So to, yeah. Yep. So to um, uh, process something like that, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess we wouldn't want to process all of them. Uh, but process some of them. You know, what, um, you know, like uh, for a, a blade, you know, with eight cores, uh, um, what, uh, with a pipeline with eight core blades with 24 gigs of RAM sort of thing, what uh, kind of, um, <laughs> how, many, how many gigs of logs can we process per second sort of thing? Um, well, we have customers doing tens of thousands a second, so it's not a problem. It's just a matter of, so Elasticsearch is built to scale horizontally, so you can, you really only want to go a certain height vertically for a, a node size, so you just keep throwing more nodes at it. Um, same with Logstash, uh, it's, um, it's just a single process, but you can, if you use a broker like Redis or Kafka or something like that, you can have multiple Logstashes reading off it and it'll pull the logs in. Um, you'd have to test that, yeah, but I'm happy to chat to, to, chat to you about that, yeah. Hey, so have you dealt with uh, like issues of data corruption between your nodes and sort of identifying and correcting that? Like, is it just does it automatically fix itself when it detects it, or uh, that's a bit of a complicated question? There is a whole bunch Sorry of there's, no, that's okay. There's been a whole bunch of uh, changes done in the later Elasticsearch to add some better checksumming around uh, index and shards. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if there's, yeah, maybe we should have a chat afterwards, but yeah, there has been work done to that. Um, historically, the biggest problem I've found using Elasticsearch is that usually I'll be asked to put it into place for someone and they either don't want to spend the time tuning it or refuse to appropriately resize up yeah. or don't want a second node or yeah. all these kind of unusual edge cases that seem like something that perhaps would be fixed if it was self-tuning the way um, some of the higher end SQL databases are. E even as a paid sort of option through the, prof per through the support channel, it, it, is there anything that is like that, even if it's like a community script or something that tunes Elasticsearch's configs for where it is based on limits? No, because it, it, it's, it depends, right? It depends on your document. What you're doing, your queries you're doing, the node you're on, the Elasticsearch, and the Elasticsearch version you're on. So the um, best option there would be to hit up the community and then, you know, say, post your config, let us know your details, your problems, and then there'll be someone that can help, maybe probably me, but well, that's okay. The, there's the, other the usual answer was more nodes or bigger node. And that well, that's, that's, uh, that is, uh, there's a point where that becomes pretty much the only answer. It was built to scale and that's kind of what you're going to do. Hi. Um, how do you get data out of it? Like, if you only want to hold data for, say, 12 months, or, you know, you have certain streams that you want to hold for three months, certain streams for six, and so on. Curator can manage that, so you can say, you know, only keep these indexes, so you can, if you use a prefix, like a name on your index, right, you give it a name, so you say keep these ones for three months, delete them afterwards. Um, you can export them, you can do, there's a snapshot and restore API to do backup so you can save them off to S3 for example. Um, you can actually pull them out with Logstash and then put them somewhere else. Um, there's a whole bunch of options. 
Okay, thank you. Thanks.